I was 14, a friend of my father bought this machine and went on vacation somewhere and he lent it to me for two weeks. I was living uh, in Normandy at the time at my parents' place, of course, 14 years old, what do you expect? And I did not leave the dining room where this thing was installed. I, teach, I taught myself programming with this machine. It was a lot of fun, it was amazing, and from that moment in 1980, I was hooked. And then I discovered several years later something that you may not be familiar with. This is the French Minitel. It should have been the alternative to the internet. French wisdom and wizardry all at once in this little box. It was fantastic. It was fantastic because in this little box you could plug it into the phone system and you could use, you could use big computers, big computers that you could never see, but they were there. You could use them. Instead of a small computer that was tiny and not very fast, you could access very large computer. It was fantastic, but it had one major issue. The system, the way the system was designed, was that basically it split the world in two parts. 99 or 99.9% .9 of people were consuming things, and they were left in that side of consumers of data and services, and there was 0.1% of professionals, people who know what they could do with these mainframe, these big computers. They were professionals, they had the control of them. And basically, if you had one Minitel, you were in the 99.9%. You could use it, you could not change anything about it, maybe expect paint the outside of the box, that was pretty much it. But the software, you had no control over it. It was exciting on one side to be using these huge computers, and at the same time, my freedom was completely limited, just using them as they were made available to me for a very high price on top of that. And something came, and it was the web. The web here is a screenshot of a web browser. The web browser is a piece of software, a software product that you install on your PC and that enables you to browse the web. At the time, we used a different word. We, we, we were saying that you could surf the information superhighway. It was really cool at the time. Uh, now we just serve the web, and I mean, we don't care. I mean, we use the net, right? But at the time, it was really, really new, thanks to this new shiny piece of software that really looks ugly now that you look at it, right? Um, but it was fantastic because, for once, the internet that existed before that suddenly became usable, easy to use, simple. Double-click on the icon, displays a page, and you could surf by clicking on these blue links and the line over there, and it would be taken to the next document. It was really cool because of that. But what was really, really cool and completely different from the Minitel is that you could create your own stuff. At the time, everybody was creating his own page on the internet. We had nothing to say, but we wanted to say it anyway. And so I created this homepage, and this was my son's homepage. He wasn't born at the time. I think it was the first time on the internet that someone was crazy like me and wanted to create a homepage for someone that did not exist. Now, Robin, my son, is 17 years old and is doing just well. Thank you. Um, so he was his own page before he was born. Um, and I loved it because I could hack, I could create, I could invent something. And this was made possible by the simple thing. In the browser, you could view the source. You could see how the page was structured. This is what you get when you view the source of that exact same page I just showed you. Well, it's a little ugly, but believe me, if you spend five minutes on this, you will get it. You will understand how it works. You can copy, you can paste, you can learn from viewing the source, and you can hack like you would play with Legos. You could create your own page. It would be ugly, but it would work. That was just magic at the time. It was completely different from the Minitel because I could build something. 
And so there was that company who made the most popular web browser at the time that was hiring in Paris where I was living. And so I decided to get hired by Netscape, which I did. It was an interesting company, a company that made something actually a bit weird in a sense that they made software that enabled people to access the web and view the source of the web pages. But at the same time, the software itself, the piece of software that we installed, was a proprietary piece of software. You could not view the source of the software itself. So basically, it was proprietary, but it would empower you to go something open, do something open. I love work, uh, working at Netscape, but in '98, uh, Netscape have, had a, you know some pretty dark times. That it it was unable to compete with giants of the internet, namely Microsoft. And so they decided, as a small company, they could not compete with Microsoft, and they had to change the rules. And what they did was just amazing. It was, I think, it was pretty crazy at the time. They decided that that piece of software, which source code was completely secret, it was the crown jewels. This piece of code would be put on the internet and would be published and made available for everyone. I suspect most people did not understand what it meant. Many people understood that it was becoming free. You didn't have to pay for it anymore. That was right, that was true. But really, the big deal is that you could view the source code. And they hoped, Netscape hoped at the time, that thousands of people will show up and help build the next version of the browser. That was pretty crazy. Uh, and they, go, they called the whole thing, this project, they called it Mozilla. Uh, and they said, it's a bold move. No, it really is a crazy idea. And so, several years passed, and they couldn't make it work. Maybe this uh, open source slash free software thing was just crazy. Uh, and after a while, they decided to give up. I was one of the employees. I was working on this. And like everybody else, I was laid off. Not cool times. And we decided to create a nonprofit organization that would take this and continue the effort. And one year and a half later, we released a new piece of software based on that work. It was called Firefox 1.0. It was November 9th, 2004. And it worked. It worked because it was a product that really was a joy to use compared to the aging competing browser. And this is how it worked. In orange, you see the takeoff and the adoption of Firefox as a web browser. In just one year, we had 50 million active users. That was crazy, that was the power of the web, and all of this was made by a nonprofit organization. And today, well, today you have choice. You can choose whatever browser you want. You may want to go proprietary, although Richard Stallman would tell you it's a really bad idea, and use Internet Explorer, or you could use Chrome, which is you know, a bit proprietary and a bit open source, or you could use Firefox, which is entirely open source. Um, do we live happily ever after? That would be nice, wouldn't it, right? Making, it, what, uh, making our dream come true? That would be nice. Yes, we went through the dark times, dark times and have been the good times, but no. No. No, because things are turning dark again. And let me explain to you why. This is a graph with the sales of PC in red and sales of smartphones in blue. This is 18 months old, and smartphones keep increasing. Basically, in 2012, more smartphones were sold than PCs. Means the PC is de facto a thing of the past. Two billion people will discover the internet and connected devices in the few years coming from now. Two billion. And what will they discover? They will discover the internet using smartphones and not PC, on which you have very limited choice of application. Look at that. Don't you notice the similarity, right, between the two? You put money in it, and you get products you can open and use. 
That's all you can do with them, right? No hacking, no creation, no nothing. You got to pay to participate, and you just consume what you're given. So the question is, how do we take the values of the web and bring them to the smartphones? This is the key issue. How can we empower people to participate and create applications on these devices and not to go back to the era of the Minitel, with the 99% we're obliged to consume and the 1% which are professionals and create for the mass? Well, this is what we want to do. This is what we're trying to do. We're building a web-based smartphone. Basically, it's a smartphone, and the only thing that runs on it is the web. This is it. So it really is easy for the web to create new stuff because it's the web. It was built for that, but we want to take this and put it on a smartphone. And it works. Here's an example of something that we're doing with a carrier in Spain and in 14 other uh, countries where we uh, have created the software for these phones which are made in China and sold in 15 countries. The interesting part, first, it runs the web. Second, it's inexpensive. Your price you see there, 59 euros, includes, it's the price of the phone including 10 euros of communication included. It's a, a, a prepaid card, so it's not, it's not something you pay for, you know, like two years. No, with that money, the phone is yours. Um, and it's really uh, is amazing. It works. It's a smartphone, except everything that runs on it is a web application. And we want to go further. Here's another example. We have built prototypes with a partner in China that will enable the phones that you see here that are basically phones that are worth less than $20 a piece. They will be sold by the end of the year by these partners. So this is really taking these freedom-based smartphones and expanding them all over the world. So here's my pledge to you. There was this crazy idea that you could serve the web, this other crazy idea that we, you could assemble you know, a community of volunteers to build a better browser. We're doing it again with a smartphone. With your help, thank you. <laughs>